This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. The Adam Neely, every melody has been copyrighted and they're on this hard drive. I sat down with Damien Real and Noah Rubin about their project to copyright every possible melody. And indeed, they have a three terabyte hard drive with uh, 68.7 billion melodies. Now, they acknowledge that there are some limitations, but they, you know, they sort of bury the lead. And instead, it's more like this clickbaity title of like, every melody has been copyrighted. Oh my God. Oh, what a big deal. And that's really not at all what the story is about. So, you know, as usual, I can't just make a clickbaity title and be like, yeah, I'm gonna go along with it. I have to I have to try and debunk it or try and tell you what's really going on in my professional and personal and apparently not so very humble opinion. But um, so what they have done is applied uh, computer programming or I don't know, a basic, very basic algorithm to one, two, or three octaves. I forget, I think it was three octaves, because they, they, they did say that if they tried to do 80, all 88 keys of the keyboard um, and used all those notes to make a 10 note sequence of a melody or something, it would be like 88 to the 10th power, uh, which would be way more than 68.7 billion melodies. Uh, and that wouldn't be necessarily possible. Uh, some Somebody said something about there'd be a hundred or so zettabytes of data in order to do that. And I think that's just in MIDI format too. That's not even in like a tonal format. It's just the notes. So I have, I have some issues with this. I think I see what they're trying to do. I think the overall message is that copyright and music has become a bit too complicated, especially with the Katy Perry, Dark Horse, Joyful Noise thing last year and the Marvin Gaye case. We didn't even go over the Marvin Gaye case. Maybe we should put that on our list. But the idea that you could copyright a groove. I think that misses the point though. I think the musicians are too worried about substantial similarity without understanding how copyright actually works. And yeah, it's concerning that you could go make a, a, a song and you could use something that sounds fun. Like, like I have this, I can't sing it for you because it's not like that. But like when I'm, when my brain is just like relaxed and is just like passing, to, like I have this like melody in my head that I just like whistle from time to time. And I'm sure that I heard it someplace. But like, what if I went, went and, and wrote a piece of music based on a melody I heard in my head? How would I know that it wasn't something I heard elsewhere? And I'm just, I'm just make creating something that's already been created and therefore it's copyright infringement. So part of that is, is the difficulty of writing new music is, is going to be, did you create it from something? Are you channeling somebody else's music? Some, some of that is also that you just have to go create music. Maybe you do so in some sort of corporate form. The reason why we have corporations, LLCs, that sort of thing is to protect you from liability personally if the corporation gets sued for something. So that of course requires money though. You have to pay money to create the corporate form. You have to account for the money in the, in the corporation and the income and all that. You have to then pay yourself somehow. And what are you, a W-2 employee or, or the owner? Do you get disbursements or do you get a salary? Uh, which, which is the best tax, uh, you know, form to be in for tax purposes, and you then have to do two sets of taxes. If you have to go to court, um, a lot of times the corporation has to be represented by a lawyer, or sometimes the owner can't represent the corporation. Um, so it, it's it's complicated. I you know I, I I agree that it's a complicated situation, but for the vast majority of people who are making music, uh, we're not talking about people who are making billboard top 100 and i don't know that that the vast majority of musicians really have to worry that they're going to be in a dark horse joyful noise situation and there's a few things that adam neely says in his video like uh you know the, the, with the dark horse and joyful noise can you really copyright a four note sequence well 
yes and no. There's more to that sentence than just four note sequence. They they sounded very similar, and the co the the standard for copyright substantial similarity is what we went over a little while ago with the extrinsic test and the intrinsic test. And so if they're both in a similar medium of ideas, and then a jury thinks that they are actually in fact substantially similar, well then yeah, that's copyright substantial similarity. And what you can get is a disgorgement of profits or statutory damages or something like that. So yes, that's all complicated. Now, can you overcome that by simply creating 68.7 billion melodies, registering that somehow with the copyright office? No, I don't think you can. I don't think that going forward that this has really changed anything at all in copyright law. And the reasons are, are because of the actual point of copyright law is not is not this is not to allow this automatic copywriting of 68.7 billion melodies let me go over how copyrights are formed first copyright comes from article 1 section 8 clause 8 of the US Constitution which says that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And copyright always only protects original expressions that are fixed in a tangible medium. I don't know that creating note sequences with a computer reaches a judge or jury's, probably judge, because that's a question of law, I think, but reaches the law's requirement of originality. The algorithm that made the melodies, yeah, that's copyrighted, but the 68.7 billion melodies that are fixed on this hard drive, they weren't created by a human, they were created by the operation of the code. So I'm not I'm not sure. And and they know. They know what they're doing. They said it at the end of the video. They're really just trying to throw a wrench in the works of copyright. They really don't think that it that it that it automatically means anything. Maybe in some case like a, a Katy Perry dark horse joyful noise situation. Dun, 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 dun. Um if that's one of the melodies that had been on this hard drive, what what does that even change? I don't think it changes anything. I think the only thing it adds is one more set of expert witnesses that file an amicus curiae brief, friend of the court brief, and try to say, oh, well, we already wrote that melody and we have a registered copyright on 68.7 And the judge looks at it and goes, are you nuts? Like, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about whether Katy Perry and, and Joyful Noise are, or Flame, um, you know, made the same, you, you used a substantially similar, not just melody, but but you know the the actual sound of it as well. Uh, I don't know that if it had been played on uh, drums or timpanis or something that it would have been you know found to be substantially similar. The, the actual song, part of the song, sounded the same or sounded substantially similar to that jury. Even if you disagree, it still sounded substantially similar to that jury. Then you ha copyright has to have this originality part to it. It has to have a minimum amount of creativity. Well, what's the creativity in the 68.7 billion melodies? Like, the creativity's in writing an algorithm that creates 68.7 billion melodies. Okay, but is the output of the algorithm your creativity? I don't know. I would argue that it's not. I'm thinking of procedurally generated games. That's a little bit different, I think, because a procedurally generated game, the algorithms are created to create within very creative limits. But this was created to create everything. So you wouldn't have a procedurally generated game where the procedural generation can create every possible permutation of pixels on the screen and gameplay and so it wouldn't have a, you know, the vast majority of outputs wouldn't even have a useful form. So I don't think that applies here. 
So I wonder if this even reaches a level of creativity that is protectable by copyright law. But then you have the major, major problem, which is that you can actually create the same thing. Like you can actually create two artists can come to the independent creation of the exact same thing as long as they did not have access, then substantial similarity doesn't win a copyright lawsuit. Copyright infringement is either copying or it's access and substantial similarity. So forget substantial similarity. Let's just give them substantial similarity. You, if you have 68.7 billion melodies, then sure, my generic melody without more is probably going to be one of those 68.7 billion melodies, okay? But did I listen to 68.7 billion melodies? Do I do even have the capacity to remember 68.7 billion melodies? I, I don't even think I have the time to listen to 68.7 billion melodies. So I'm going to guess that access will never be able to be proven on this unless someone actually goes and listens to the melodies and goes, oh yeah, I like that one, and then makes a song out of it. And even then, they've released this as Creative Commons or something, so the worst you have is a license violation of the Creative Commons license, and hardly anybody ever sues over that. It does happen, it's not impossible, but it's unlikely. So I think more what they've done here is just made a, a fun thought experiment. And then we've made sort of a, our own video trying to explain why their thought experiment is just a thought experiment. But really, at the end of the thing, they say they're just throwing a wrench in the works. And I think that's all that it really is, is they're throwing a wrench in the works of copyright. And it's really not even a wrench that the gears can't chew up and spit out and deal with. like. The machinery is sort of made to deal with that problem by sort of dismissing it from a lawsuit or claim. But it's a fun thought experiment, I guess. It certainly was fun for me to think about it. But come on, I really can't imagine that anybody thinks that 68.7 billion melodies on a hard drive in MIDI format, which also means that they're not orchestrated, they haven't chosen an instrument, they haven't expressed themselves into a tangible medium expression. They've coded something into a tangible medium of expression. What would be the effect of the, uh, the monkeys on a typewriter problem? Since we do have computers now, what if I can create a hard drive full of every book, uh, you know, every, every story that could be written that is less than 10 pages long? But that'll happen, you know, as computing power gets more, gets f stronger and stronger, faster and faster, or just time goes on, somebody could create a computer program that writes every combination of letters and words that makes any sort of sense whatsoever at any length. So at some point, someone could have a 200 zettabyte hard drive that has every story man could ever write up to a certain length or complexity or something. Does that mean that they actually creatively express themselves into a tangible medium of expression and therefore they own those stories? I don't think so, let alone that you have to register those copyrights in order to have those rights recognized at $55 a pop or whatever. So I don't think they're registering 68.7 billion melodies, and there are limits on how many melodies can be well, I mean, assuming taking, taking each melody individually, if each one was a track on a disc or something like on an album, you can only register so many. I think it's 20. Or at least the proposal, I think, is 20. There's a proposal for registering albums and artwork and everything at one time, and I think the, the limit there is 20. I don't know what the current limit is off the top of my head. But yeah, I, there's, there's problems with this. I don't think that anybody needs to act on this claim by being concerned in any way is what I'm trying to say. But hey, fun thought experiment. Simple baselines can be copyrighted. Yes, any minimally creative expression fixed in a tangible medium can be. And I'm arguing that this is not an expression. This is not an artist's creative expression. This is the output of a computer program, the dry output of a computer program. It's not even like they wrote a computer program that knew how to uh, replicate the expression, uh, musical expression, this time I'm talking about, the musical expression of a great cellist like Yo-Yo Ma. 
And even then, if I wrote a great, if, if I wrote a very, if I wrote a minimally expressive or minimally creative piece of music on the piano that had eight notes in common with a un, otherwise unrelated piece from Yo-Yo Ma, that gets put to a jury to decide if it's substantially similar or not. And they might say that, no, it's not. But the just to go back to the Katy Perry, because it keeps showing up here on the right, um, the Katy Perry Dark Horse thing was because they both had a similar background beat. Da, 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 da. They also sounded quite similar. And then Adam Neely says something in here that really bothers me, like, oh, how could Katy Perry... Katy Perry said she didn't listen to that flame, uh, joyful noise music. Uh, yeah, Katy Perry doesn't write her own music. Katy Perry's part of the writing process, but Katy Perry's writers are well-known musicologists who would have listened to Joyful Noise. That's what the court said, if you remember. Either way, it's a fun thought experiment. That is our show, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This is a community-supported legal education channel. We would not exist without your financial support. Please do consider donating on a monthly basis to our channel at patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.com slash law. In the month of February, our $50 plus supporters are Aspernari. Video Demonetized, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Blackleaf, Joe Tyson, Benjamin Hightoff, Steven, Q Grills in Your Area, Ada, Keisel, and Longreach Jones. And the $5 plus supporters will be scrolling on the screen in front of me, and you will all be in the description of the videos below. Really appreciate you all. I'm going to go rest up. Hopefully, I'll feel better very soon, and I'll see you in the next video. Love you all. Bye.